Hello viewers, we are back again. This is Literary Goa, the program that discusses authors and books. And today with us we have Dr. Selsa Pinto, uh, who is a historian, the author of seven books as you can see, uh, all in front of us here. Doctor, to start with, we know you in many roles, okay, director of education, historian. Why history? Why did you enter the world of history and how? I must confess that my favorite subject in school was mathematics. But my mother forced me hmm. to love all subjects. And that included different languages like Urdu, history, and what not. I must tell you that my father played a very great role in uh, developing an interest in history. He exposed me to historical films, especially biblical films like Ben Hur, Co Vadis, Shoes of the Fisherman. Those were the days when all these were popular. Yes. And my mother introduced me to books. But amongst the books were biblical stories. And that's, that meant biblical history. I did love history when I was in school. I did love it. I remember that um, even Indian history I was interested in. In our building in Karachi, we had uh, Rikers. And uh, Rajas Riker was my best friend. So Rikers she, are goldsmiths from Goa? Goa. In Karachi? In Karachi, in my very building. I see. And she, I used, she used to ask me as to what, what I needed from Goa. And she used to bring me small story books yes. on Vikramaditya or on Chandragupta Maurya. And so I had a knowledge of Indian history and I loved the stories of such heroes. This is 1950s? 1960s. 60s. Yeah, 50, yeah, 55, 50s, yeah. 55 to 64. Okay, 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 okay. So, so then, uh, of course, you mentioned Karachi and uh, I know you personally, so I know you were born there, you brought up there, you came down to Goa as a young school girl. Yes, I was 13 years of age. Yeah. And uh, we came in January 1965. I see. And uh, my mother was keen to have still the Karachi connection. Yeah. So that is why she chose Lourdes Convent for my entry. I see. Into in schooling Saligam, in here in Saligam. And because uh, I started nans, with the nans, nans, yes, were the same. nans. Yes. Um, uh, they will, uh, we had the same con congregation there Francis in Karachi. Kin, missionaries Franc of yes. Christ the King. Yes. FMCK. That's why. Um, I see. I see. So, when did the choice come to take history and how did you actually jump into it? At Actually, college? I was, no, no, at school itself, I, as I said, my favorite subject was mathematics. And I was getting ready to be a teacher, sure, and s certain, but a teacher of mathematics. I so I wanted to do my graduation in mathematics, BSc. Wow. But there are certain circumstances which I would not like yeah, to recall yeah, yeah. a little bitter. Yeah. Uh, in, um, in the school itself, yeah, yeah. in SSE class itself, that forced me I to see. change uh, 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 track. And once I chose that track, means I went for arts, yeah. I, I chose history, I majored in history and there was no turning back. You did your MA in history? And I did my graduation in history yeah. and also Master. masters in history. And then PhD, but that's yeah. ahead of the story. We'll talk about your last books first, that is uh, Panjim, you know, because this is, or last year was the 175th year of the founding of Panjim. Yes. And you came out with two books. Can you just uh, briefly tell us, you know, what Colonial Panjim and Anatomy of a Colonial Capital are all about? Actually, I chose to research uh, on, uh, on this capital, the second capital of Portuguese India. After Old Goa. After Old Goa. Uh, because I, f I felt that a lot of, uh, uh, you could say, uh, uh, that, uh, that um, old Goa, Siddhartha the Goa, which today is known as old Goa, uh, it was in the limelight, studies, uh, urban studies on that capital, stole the limelight. That, yeah, and this was a, a neglected field. Means academically, at least, it was not researched. 
and therefore I thought I should not only I should see it from all points of view. The first book, Anatomy of a Colonial Capital, uh, deals with the growth yeah. and physical development of Panjim from what it was a ward yeah. of Taligaon, a marshy area, a fishing really? locali locality, yeah. to a town to becoming the ca a capital city. And uh, this book uh, concentrates on land acquisition, landfill, and land use. It's got amazing details in it. No, I mean, you go into all these small localities, some of which are still the same, incidentally, and people being described and family names. Some of the families also might be the same, no? In that sense. The first uh, locality that came yeah. up as an urban, within this uh, huge urban space of Panjim, yeah. uh, the first locality was Fontaineers. And many of the people of Fontaineers of those days, yeah. the different generations, are there. you have them still today. The families are there. Yes, still today. And then after after that, how did Panjim grow? After Fontaineus, where did it grow to? Um, actually, Fontaineus, of, and of, it was around the, the Portuguese palace, the palace, the govern, as it, as it was called. That is the secretariat. That is the old, old, secretariat. old secretariat. And uh, they, from, from there, they built up the central zone of Panjim, yeah. around the church and around the secretariat, old secretariat, around the palace. From there it spread to Kampal, Bokadavaka area, and so forth. So, Doctor, all these places were old, but Miramar is a recent addition to Panjim. I think it, uh, the starting point of Miramar might be the 1930s. Yeah. And in a, in a, at a faster pace, you had it only after Liberation. 1961. Yeah. So this, that's the first book. The second book, Doctor, has as much details, but it's different in the sense that it talks about uh, what aspects? Yeah, colonial pantrim, its governance, its people. Yeah. It focuses on three aspects. Uh, firstly, the governance, the yeah. administration. Secondly, the importance is given to the human element, yeah. that is the people, especially society and economy. Uh, uh, very fascinating details I yeah. have been able to gather from the records relating to the administration of, of the city of Pantrim, and that is with, uh, with paucity of funds and manpower, they were able to uh, provide a number of utilities and uh, basic needs they you were able to attend to um, and we see that uh, whether it was a movement of traffic on the roads or uh, issues like law and order and even uh, attending to the public structures the maintenance the repair of public structures the uh, maintenance of uh, water supply a lot of thought has yeah. gone into it. A lot of yes. thought and work has gone. Gone into it. And um, uh, the only thing that was quite a problem in those days was sanitation, sanitation. and health. And you, as many know, that even Panjim, not only Old Goa, but even Panjim was a victim of or was subjected to various uh, epidemics, which included uh, cholera, plague. Uh, and so forth. I, see. I have a chapter here on public health, which is uh, which I think is an interesting chapter as to how the authorities coped with it. That they even went to the extent of uh, of uh, paying uh, rewards to people who caught rats, rats. and snakes. And this so, by the tails. They counted. They counted. Yeah, counted. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were counted. By the, the tails. Yes, by the tails. Yeah. Amazing. True. So all this requires a lot of work. You have to sit in the in the archives, in the dusty, smelly archives for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you spent a lot of time. Yes, uh, I did spend much time in the Goa archives, especially uh, reading uh, through the proceedings of the uh, the municipality because it was dealing with administration. So I, the proceedings of the municipality, the complaints of the people, how the municipality attended to all this. 
I also relied on the bulletin of the CIs, that is the government gazette, yeah. and um, it, it, it's uh, it's an eye opener to anyone they were good because even person, though they know. had yeah. uh, la uh, less funds and uh, manpower. I am yeah, sure yeah. the manpower is not like like today. the manpower of the government today. today. And with, with that kind of manpower, you find in the records, weekly reports of, on law and order, I on see. health, on education. I see. Every department uh, gave their uh, weekly reports. Somehow Such they, a thing is absent today. They were good record keepers, not the Portuguese in that sense, Correct. Whatever, we, Correct. whatever we blame them for. Yeah. Uh, the other point, Doctor, I wanted to ask you about is uh, your study of the Portuguese language. We know you grew up in Karachi and like us, English speaking, many families and things like that. Uh, how did you pick up Portuguese and how did you pick it up so well to go into all this archaic forms of the language probably? Actually, um, my mother did not encourage uh, me from speaking in Portuguese. Because Though she wanted they... you to learn English? strictly because of that yeah so uh, the issue it was a problem in the beginning i hesitated yeah. a lot for years together my phd studies have began quite late i, I had passed out in 75 and it took it up only in uh, in uh, 87 okay. so it was a big big uh, gap to overcome this aversion it took me quite some time. It, actually, I had a hatred for the language. Yeah. And, uh, a new language is but always tough. I, but I, I'll tell you that um, I got a tip uh, from Anton Menezes, Antonio de the Menezes. Editor, he, the editor, the editor. Yeah, the, the editor. Yeah. So he told me that 80% of the Portuguese words are the same as English. You know, he gave me that tip. If you're fluent in English, you will be able to understand. 80% of the words. This was one, one tip he gave me. Yeah. To give you an example, like uh, comercio, commerce. So like that, so many, so, so many such words. When I went to the archives, I couldn't make head nor tail of anything of those records. Yeah. But, and I tried, you know, even to trans, uh, use a dictionary to translate. Yeah. I took some passages to my father, to my uncle for their help, but they could not understand anything. I so I just used my historical sense yeah. relating to what I, was, I needed to foc focus on, a, uh, on yeah. and plus the tip wow. that uh, Anton Menezes gave me and I just went ahead. And uh, initially, I, uh, you know, I Needed was, help. yeah, no, I just skipped pages. Yeah, but yeah. then I prepared an index and then went back to the records again and again. Wow. And I can say confidently that today, 90% yeah, yeah. of each page of any record right. in the archives, I see. Not necessarily the 16th, yeah. but from 17th century, I am able to understand 90% wow. of wow. a page. Only uh, because of this kind I of see. approach. Determination pays. Yeah. And if you were not to do it, probably no one would have done it. Yeah. So, uh, this is your first book. You mentioned your PhD thesis, Trade yeah. and Finance in Portuguese India. Yeah. Summary of it? Uh, See, this first book of mine, Trade and Finance, and the third book of mine, yeah. Situating into portuguese Trade History, A yeah. Commercial Resurgence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say they complement each other. They are both books on Indian Ocean Studies. Hmm. Dr. Teoton Arda Souza, who was my PhD guide, he had... Who passed away recently. Recently. He pushed me into this field. He said, said, he, said, he said this, he said, this is a virgin field that you're going to do. Economic history. Se economic his commercial history from 1770 to 1830. And this he said on the basis of the Mamai Kamath records that he acquired for the Xavier Center. And he had already presented a paper on it. He said, see, there's so much of material relating to it. And this will give you recognition. I was not interested in recognition. I, I just, he was the man that I chose as my guide and I went ahead. 
Now, these two books, they uh, explore, explode the myth that just 16th century commerce yeah. should, uh, you know, sh is the main thing. As far as, as Portuguese Goa goes. Yeah, that far as yeah, Portuguese India, Portuguese, Portuguese India. India. And that it is the glorious people, uh, period yeah. of, uh, you know, of uh, trade, of, trade of, yeah, basically. But this is relating to the 18th and 19th centuries. So you're saying it was still continuing then and still had it's its still continuing and this, this particular period, 18, uh, 17, yeah. uh, 70 to 1830 was actually a period of revival, a commercial revival. That's why I have meant uh, my third book is a commercial resurgence. It's a period of revival. And uh, that was not only official trade, but also the unofficial trade. What one. kind of products were, uh, were being uh, 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 The splendid as well as the trifling. I the see. splendid in opium, in ivory, in gold, in bullion, in, uh, and uh, in slaves. As, as uh, you uh, must be aware of, yeah. that ivory, bullion and slaves came from Mozambique right. and uh, opium came from, from Malwa, Malwa, especially Malwa opi opium went right up to Macau. The trifling trade in textiles, timber, tobacco, rice and other provisions. And this, this first one yeah. emanated from Portuguese India, this this uh, commer uh, commerce, yeah, yeah? and pri privately operated, especially the Mamai Kamats of Goa were involved in it. And the second one is the Lisbon enterprise, the the private traders I see. who uh, who were located in uh, Lisbon, people like the Loreros and the Jacinth uh, Domingues, they are involvement in in the Indian Ocean in this particular time frame. You mentioned the Mamai Kamats, which is a huge trading family of Correct. the past, yeah. very close to the Goa old secretariat. Okay. Uh, so like you know, I mean you are dealing with another century, with other languages, with different empires. Didn't mm -hmm. you feel at some stage like you are searching for a pin in a haystack? It's such a complex field. Now of course we have these books to make sense of what is there. But didn't you feel that, you know, you're searching for a pin in a haystack? Very often I felt that. But I think the, um, uh, the PhD work exposed me to Mamai Kamath papers. And so I went straight to that first. Right. And I, the, those records became the staple uh, source for this book. Wow. Yeah. Then, of course, I went to the archives. And there was a set, a series, Alfandigas, that means customs records. I see. Yeah, it was untouched. I am the, I'm, I'm perhaps wow. the first person to touch it. Really? It's just in the Rotero, I'm the first. And relating to this, it was a mine of information. But, and it was all, you know, recorded what goods were coming, what type, what quality, first sort, second sort, third sort. What is the price? What is the tax at oh, the wow. port? And whose consignment coming from where? So when I went with this information to Dr. Teotonio, yeah. I asked him, how am I to use this? Yeah. So he told me, you use it as you wish. Yeah. You have a chapterization. So I decided to use the statistical approach. That is how, with my mathematics I interest, I combined it with uh, economic history. You yeah. made a very interesting point that uh, you know you were the first to touch these records. I get this feeling that you know we don't care enough for our history. Am I right? Would you agree with me? Yes. Not enough students working on it. There is so much here. You know Goa was kind of a meeting point of cultures, clashing point of cultures. We need to study more of it. Would you say? I, I definitely agree with you and it all begins in the school. Even though the, the, there is a segment of local history, history of Goa attached, you know, to the curriculum, I, for some reason the teachers are, uh, are not interested. They, they prefer, the, they are used to the Marathas, the history of yeah. the Marathas and the Mughals and things like that. But our own local history, 
Uh, uh, no one is interested. I, will, I can say it with all uh, authority because I have myself uh, gone for inspections to the in, uh, schools and I would insist that they should, uh, you know, uh, um, for the inspection that they should present a, uh, a lesson in history. They would prefer the easy way out, the civics and administration that showed how they, uh, you know, that history, they had uh, not a very uh, good grip on and especially local history. I guess when it's national, it's easier to get so much, so many sources and here we have to generate our own and all that. But you were the director of education and uh, tell us a little bit about your own experience in education, right from a school teacher to director's post. Where all did you teach? What was your experience like? Which level did you like the best teaching? I started in 1972 at Our Lady of Devar High School, yeah. a diocesan society education school. I was a graduate teacher. I taught uh, English and social studies in the higher classes. And it was a very uh, uh, fruitful period, six yeah. year period from 72 to 78. Our headmaster was very strict, but I think that was the basis for what was to come f later on yeah. in life for me. After having, while I was uh, teaching, teaching there, I did my masters. Yeah. And therefore, I thought I should move to the next phase. Yeah. And uh, with the help of a walk-in interview, I, I entered into Chogle College. I and I taught there for 16 years. Wow. From 72 till um, um, 94. I see. 94. I taught history. I since there was no change in the syllabus and all, the, the batches were different. Uh, yeah. That was the pleasure of teaching a new yeah. batch. But the curriculum was not undergoing change. So I thought there should be a novelty in my life. I, actually, I never believed that I should go into administration. Yeah. But suddenly there appeared in the, uh, you know, an ad in the papers, uh, Goa Public Service Commission, they had uh, uh, put in an ad. I. Uh, this was for assistant director or director? No, it no. was for, uh, uh, it was a principal of high secondary, but slash deputy director of state institute of education. education. Okay. So I, I went for the, there were 14 of us I see. shortlisted for the interview. Three of us from uh, private sector yeah. and the rest were from the government. I see. We were so certain that they would get the post. I see. But for two vacancies, the private people got. I, I, I was one of I them. See. And as I stood first, yeah. I was given, I could choose between the posts. So I, I chose to be the deputy director okay. of State okay. Institute of Education at Porvani to work under somebody. I see. To work, otherwise I would have been principal at, at government high secondary uh, Kandola. I see. Then uh, later I became the assistant director yeah. and the deputy director and Finally, the director. I retired oh. in 2011, but I, uh, I, I, ha I had, a, I had to face a lot of uh, struggle. It's, it's not, tough. It's, it's, tough. Tough. it's tough. But I have, I think I have to my credit the yeah. fact that I was the longest. Uh, I was the director with the longest tenure I see. since liberation. I see. Yeah. Wow. Six years, wow. no doubt. Not a very big period. Wow. Director, but that's yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one uh, below, I mean, be, just below that was four and four years, four, four months. So I see. six years would make it the longest tenure. I see. And doctor, these books also came out after your uh, retirement. So could yeah. you introduce these briefly? Yeah, this is this was my second book, yeah. Goa Images and Perceptions. It's a collection of 10 research papers, okay. most of them economic. Uh, some political and some um, uh, social. So an interesting paper was uh, it is uh, with reference to Tipu Sultan, Tipu Sultan's designs on Goa. I see. Fact or fiction? Is, I see. Is one of the and papers. And what's your conclusion? Fact or fiction? Uh, the first period yeah. that is up to 92 yeah. from the 80s, uh, 1780s 70. to 92, he was powerful. Yeah. And actually, he was not interested in Goa. But from after that, from 92 to 99, yeah. he had his eyes on Goa. And he colluded with the French. Yeah. And that time, Napoleon Bonaparte was there in France. Right. 
and they wanted all of them yeah. wanted goa to be a launching pad attack to attack in british india b- british india especially british india. bombay presidency oh, wow. so this is one of the papers then okay. there is a ref- reference there is one paper which refers to the hinterland trade while i have always dealt with seaborne trade so the hinterland trade Carrera the Balagat I is see. one. Then another which refers to, uh, you know, um, formation of uh, of a society for for trade with China in cotton, oh. in raw cotton, in Goa. So like that, there are a number of research papers of, uh, as I said, mainly economic. There's there's one on the Anglo-Portuguese treaty of uh, 18, uh, 1878. 78. Yeah, because of which we got the Murmugao railway yeah, yeah. line, but we had to pay a heavy price for that. The salt industry also got disrupted. It's and not only disrupted, it yeah. came to be, uh, you know, it uh, received a salt as well yeah. as the liquor industry received a severe blow oh. because the British, they uh, came here and controlled, they supervised yeah. the uh, salt production and the why salt. Why salt, doctor? Liquor, you can understand why yeah, salt? Because salt, salt also, they had their own industry in British India. So it was a challenge to I that. See. I see. And uh, is it true that Panjim was built on tobacco money also? On opium. On opium money? Yeah. My goodness. Yes. And that is exactly this. In this same period, yeah. 1770 to 1830, uh, Gaur, Daman and Dew were engaged in the uh, opium trade with uh, Macau. And that is also a cause for the resurgence. This is one of the factors for commercial re- resurgence and increase in revenues. And so, uh, Panjim, especially some structures which we see even today, I that see. is in the 1830s they were built. Like, like the that whole block of the collectors and, yeah. and the police headquarters and things like that. Yeah. That whole block that is one. Then the customs house. I see. The customs house. Then what is today known as the military hospital. Yeah. There there was a jail. I see. So these these were due to opium revenues, but not only that. Lot Kampal came up because of opium. Re- starting point of Kampal I see. I is see. due to opium revenues, and the whole, uh, you know, uh, the opening up of uh, the uh, the road network yeah. here in Panjim under Dom Manuel the Portugali uh, that. Uh, you know, was due to opium revenues and would not have been possible if it was not for these revenues. We wouldn't do justice to your name if we didn't talk about this book, Forgotten Martyrs. Yes, uh, I have entitled this book, A Revolt of the Natives of Goa, 1787, The Forgotten Martyrs. Pinto Revolt. Yes, but I have shown very clearly in this book that there's just a Pinto link. Okay. And really, it is a revolt of the natives of Goa. I see. Yeah. So there Which are got Koto's, misnamed as the Pinto, yeah. Yeah, it, it got uh, maybe because the man who received, maybe I say, yeah. the man who received the highest punishment, that is, dragged to the streets of uh, of Goa uh, tied to the tails of horses and then beheaded and uh, quartered and the head his head was put up on, on a pike stick. on yeah so the, uh, that is Manuel Kaitan Pint maybe because of him I, I do not know also Kunya Rivara uh, it was partial to the Pintos in some way, I don't know. I but to me, it's a revolt of the natives of Goa, a bottled revolt, no doubt. And uh, it was well planned, conceived in Lisbon, and implemented by, tried, they tried to implement. Uh, Father Koth and Father Gonsalves tried to implement it. And uh, there's a lot of details of, Very uh, of uh, meetings at parochial houses, at residences, and so forth. The first one, of course, yeah. was in the Pinto house at Kandoni. Yeah. Interesting. One, one last question. Uh, what's your advice to young people wanting to enter this field? My advice? Yeah. Should they or shouldn't they? We need historians, but it's a tough field. My ad- ad- in the sense that History is relevant. You can't think of the present and the future without the past. And particularly the history of Goa. 
which is a neglected field. It begins in the school, as I already said. But you should know your heroes. You should know the happenings of the past. If you don't know your history, then what should you know? And therefore, history is, is not lost its relevance. You can make a career in history. You can be a teacher of history. You can do research in history. The archives and the central library, they are, the records, they are crying for attention and they are crying for your attention. You, the young people of Goa. Thank you so much, Doctor, and looking forward to much more work from your pen and from you mentoring other young people also. Thank you. Thank and you for inviting me. Thanks.